Fantastic. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Uh, I know I'm kind of between you and lunch, so I won't be, keep you too long. So uh, I'm going to start with Ezekiel Emanuel. So I don't know if you've heard of this chap. He's, he's not a radiologist. Uh, he's an American bioethicist, and he actually uh, helped advise on the development of Obamacare. But anyway, he's been, he's not a radiologist, as I said, but he's commented a lot on radiology and on the potential threat that machine learning poses to the future of imaging. And he said this, and he actually said this in front of the American uh, Congress of Radiology, and he left alive. Machine learning will become a powerful force in radiology in the next five to ten years and could end radiology as a thriving specialty. Now, these sorts of quotes really can become quite pervasive and demoralizing in many ways. Uh, but I think he's got it completely wrong. And I think many people who comment on this from outside the world of radiology really don't really understand, have a deep understanding of what it is that radiologists do. So I'm actually going to talk a little bit about uh, cardiac imaging in particular and the role of AI and machine learning in that, and really how it could be pivotal in transforming the role and importance of radiology in understanding heart disease and in better able to manage patients. So I don't know if any of you are thinking about a career in mammography at all. So um, this is your major threat here. So this is a great piece of research that was done uh, a year or two ago now, uh, training uh, pigeons to read uh, mammograms. So here we have it. So actually, they, they train them on histology slides as well as, as mammograms. So the video here is of uh, histology. So they present them a set of these histology images, uh, and they get fed a little bit more food if they correctly identify it as benign versus malignant, and then they peck on one side. If it's benign, there we go, peck, peck, peck. Uh, and on the other side, so you're looking at the radiology department of the future uh, right now. Uh, now, of course, the irony was that, um, they call this flock sourcing, that the flock sourcing actually was somewhat better than the consultant radiologists, um, which probably says more about breast images than anything else. So this is just a little summary here, because I know there's a little bit of loose talk about some of the uh, nomenclature in this. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. Uh, and actually, some of the earliest ideas were developed by Alan Turing. And he, of course, came up with this concept of the Turing test, uh, where a machine would be deemed truly intelligent when you couldn't tell its responses apart from humans. And of course, we could imagine uh, the Eureka test, I suppose, when you couldn't tell a machine-driven radiology report from a radiologist report, uh, and who knows whether that might happen or not. So a lot of these AI and machine learning developments um, have sort of centered around games, uh, so the, the, the development of uh, machines to play uh, different human games. So of course AI is the development of machines that can mimic or simulate human reasoning and perception and so on. Machine learning, there's no explicit program. It's a machine that improves by experience. Uh, and this was first developed, uh, one of the first events was with um, IBM uh, for a machine to play uh, checkers or drafts in the uh, very early 50s. IBM Deep Blue was the first machine to beat a uh, chess grandmaster, Gary Kasparov, uh, in the, the mid 80s. And more recently, we've turned towards deep learning. Deep learning has been really transformative in improving the performance of machines at visual classification tasks and things that we thought that we were, were quite uniquely human, that were difficult to solve in other ways. Uh, from Google publishing uh, a, a system of reinforcement learning, learning how to play Atari games, of all things, towards AlphaGo beating the world champion. Uh, so this is actually one of the uh, first demonstrations of artificial intelligence. This is, uh, you might instantly recognize these. These are supposed to be uh, tortoises. Uh, and this was in the Festival of Britain uh, back in the early 50s. And here they are. So you can see actually the way this worked is that this little mechanical tortoise responded to light or moved towards light or moved away from noise and so on. And its programming was sort of based around a sort of circuit board design uh, like this. We've got an example of one of the surviving mechanical tortoises on the other side. This was thought to be very un-British uh, because conditioned reflexes weren't thought to be a trait of the British people. Uh, so actually it was initially turned down for the Festival of Britain. Um, but this sort of logic circuit that's been designed by a human to replicate animal behaviour was one of the first sort of examples. But actually a lot of what uh, we look at in terms of artificial intelligence is really machine learning. So this is where there's no explicit programming. We'll design the structure 
um, of our, our algorithm, but we'll let it uh, improve with experience. And many of this is around deep learning. So for instance here, this is a type of neural net. So this is loosely based on a biological system of uh, the way neurons are connected in the brain. Um, and what we may want to do, for instance, is to train it to recognize numbers, for instance. So during the training phase, we will present the input layer, which is on one side, um, with a number of different numbers, and then find the optimal way of propagating from that input the correct classification. Now what's between the input and the output are these hidden layers. And uh, this is why it's called deep learning. The more of these hidden layers you have, uh, the more complex the network, uh, and this is what gives its name uh, for deep learning. So you present the data in the training phase, we'll maybe present it with lots of different numbers, different fonts, sizes, orientations, and so on, with what the, the answer is, the correct answer. And then it will learn how to propagate that pixel information from that input layer through all those hidden layers to the correct classification at the other end. So that when it sees new numbers, it will be able to identify and classify that, but independently of shifts and alterations and fonts and so on. So it will be quite robust. And of course we can do the same sort of thing for image classification in radiology. And here are just some of the examples. Uh, we've got uh, fantastic image uh, object recognition in the top left. This is James Bond um, jumping around here. And you can see how it dynamically in real time is able to simultaneously uh, track every object and label it very accurately. And of course we're familiar with um, the driverless cars and robotics and so on. And these similar sorts of techniques have uh, really been transformative in understanding uh, many disease processes, particularly in the brain. And we have an example from our collaborators in the bottom right here of automatic labelling or segmentation of uh, brain lesions here. But actually I think it's important we take a, a little step back. Um, we have a lot of technology here that we can throw at a problem, but actually I think as Steve Jobs once said, you've got to start with the patient experience and work backward to the technology. And I think this is a really important concept that actually we think of what's uh, what's really important for patients, what we're not providing patients at the moment, for which technology might be the answer, and not the other way around. So actually we held a really useful uh, sort of brainstorming meeting with patients, with charity representatives, with nurses and so on. Uh, and this is on our website if you want to have a look at it later. These are the visual minutes. To really kind of catalogue and document um, the difficulties that patients had in getting the right diagnosis, getting the appropriate treatment, and actually making informed decisions about their own health and how they felt about data being used and how they felt about machines being involved in their care. So don't look too closely about the number of tubes here in the heart because uh, the artist got a little bit confused I think at this point but what it does demonstrate is that actually with the right safeguards patients are really positive about having their data used, about engaging uh, with new technology because actually what's really important to patients is making informed decisions that are really based around them, that aren't about generalised statistics, that are actually about their own situation, their own risk factors, their own values and so on. But the message is quite positive and we'll come back a little bit to, to this at the end as well. So I'm a cardiac radiologist, uh, so these are the sorts of uh, images that I work with, these are all MRs of different types of heart muscle disease, going from a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, which is a common cause of sudden death, dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, commonest cause of heart transplant, Takatsubo broken heart syndrome, uh, so this is the name for a, a Japanese pickled octopus jar, the shape of which resembles the heart in this condition, and a whole load of different other things. Now many of these abnormalities actually have similar volumes and mass and so on, but we're able to distinguish them from recognising differences in shape and function uh, and other characteristics. So there's actually quite an important human element of pattern recognition. So in many ways this is like the current workflow that we have. We scan these patients, we measure something, we often measure things that are relatively easy to measure, like the volume and mass and thickness uh, of the heart and so on, and then we'll form a diagnosis based on that and then use those relatively simple features to try and risk stratify. And risk stratification is what it's all about in many ways because we want the imaging to change the management. And it's by risk stratification that we can decide which patients should have which treatments. But in many ways I think it's better to reimagine this whole process. And this isn't necessarily just uh, linked to cardiac imaging, it's generalizable to radiology. 
So we image the patient, but we want to segment those images. So we want to automatically label those images and actually create a realistic digital model of the organ. We can then classify those uh, different diseases in a more data-driven approach, not enforcing what we think is important and differentiates patients, but actually let that be driven by the data. We can then learn to predict from that complex data how to predict patient outcomes and how to link that to genetics and other information to make this really individual. And this individualization of, uh, of treatment and management is really important. This is a really strong message uh, from the patients. They want their treatment decisions to be closely linked to information about them. And this slide is from Eric Topol. We'll come back to Eric Topol. Uh, and he's sort of uh, put together this idea of panoramic biological data, going from quantitative ideas about our, our environment, the exposome, to metabolomics, proteomics, but imaging is very much part of this. Quantitative imaging of body systems and organs is an incredibly important part of this in understanding what our uh, biological fingerprint is. So what is the potential role of machine learning in cardiac imaging? So I've just summarised uh, a few of the key points here. So we've got segmentation. As I said, segmentation is converting those grayscale images into something that's meaningful for a machine. So it's labelling according to their anatomy uh, and it's tracking their motion and so on. So we want to classify. We want to be able to make a meaningful diagnosis and that might be really quite different to the sorts of diagnoses that we're used to. We're increasingly here about cancer. Uh, you know, one particular type of anatomical cancer actually being comprised of you know, maybe a dozen different types of molecular cancer. And the same sort of thing can apply to other diseases. Much more data driven. As radiologists, we perhaps think that we're pretty great at, uh, at diagnosis, but all of us are pretty rubbish at prognosis, at making predictions about our patient's health. Not what their health is right now, but how it's going to develop and change in the future, and what interventions might be most influential. We're rubbish at doing that, and it's the most important thing. We delegate that to the clinicians, but actually we have all the information to be able to do that. And I'll touch on how we can achieve that uh, later. We can also start to delve into the mechanisms that underlie uh, heart failure, as well as accelerate the development of new treatments. So this goes all the way really from simple mechanical things of labelling images, really to being able to make predictions about patients, understand disease in new ways, and accelerate the journey towards improved treatments. So just in simple terms, this is an example of image segmentation. So this is, I don't know how many of you know about UK Biobank, UK Biobank is a study of half a million people from the UK between the ages of 40 to 70, uh, and around 100,000 of those are having MR imaging. It's an enormous resource, so about uh, 35,000 so far uh, have had a scan, including my mother-in-law uh, last week, uh, who survived. Um, and this is just one of the examples here of how you can train a machine to be able to label these images automatically. So you can analyse these images, you can scale this up to 100,000 patients. We can analyse these in an afternoon. It's an unthinkable acceleration of speed. And it's at least as good, if not more consistent, than uh, human observers. So here we've done this with, with patients. So this is a patient with pulmonary hypertension. We'll talk a, a little bit more about what sort of disease that is, for instance. Uh, but we have the input image on the left. This is the cine image, uh, a cross-section of the, the left and right ventricles. And here we have the output image. So this is like a digital representation of the heart in cross-section. And you can see the richness of information that's in there, and particularly the complex motion of the septum as well, which is a really critical uh, clinical feature of this disease that we really don't measure or quantify at all. The processing time is less than one heartbeat. So we can do this virtually in real time. We don't need a high performance computer. You could do it on your laptop or your phone. So it's very, very practical to uh, scale this up and use it in the NHS. But we don't want to stop there with just labelled images. We want to actually build a digital model of the heart. So this is uh, where we use some new techniques to be able to take those two-dimensional images of the heart and actually estimate what the underlying three-dimensional shape of it was. And we can get these very realistic uh, 3D meshes of the heart moving in real time. Now the neat thing is we don't just do this on each patient in isolation we use an atlas. So it's a bit like a geographic atlas in that it has uh, like latitude and longitude for each point in the heart. 
So we can take all of these images from 100,000 healthy people, from maybe thousands of patients with cardiomyopathy or different types of heart disease, and all put them in the same reference space so we can make comparisons between them. So for instance, a relatively trivial task, but one that's still useful, is a machine that could do the job of diagnosing uh, heart disease for us. So for instance, here we have the task is to differentiate between healthy people, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is an abnormal thickening of the heart, not due to uh, uh, valve disease or high blood pressure and so on, and dilated cardiomyopathy, which is just a, a dilated heart essentially, but a common cause of heart failure and um, transplantation. And here I've shown three examples where they're all quite different, but actually of course many patients will overlap, particularly in the early stages of disease, overlap between diseases and between health and disease. And this is the neural net, so I've simplified this a little bit, but to give the impression uh, of, of, of just what it does. So many of these neural nets are basically data compression techniques. So we've got those input images on the left, so there are 3D models moving in time, and what we're trying to do is faithfully reconstruct those images from a smaller number of features. So we're trying to decode those from a small number of features shown by the yellow dots. But we also want to reward this network here for discriminating between disease types. So we're trying to find simple patterns in that complex data that are highly discriminative between different diseases. And why are we doing it this way? Because not only is it really effective at diagnosing patients based not just on their structure but also the motion of their heart, but it's interpretable as well. So for instance, here is how the machine would divide those three classes and you can see it's differentiated quite well between the healthy people, those in HCM and those with uh, DCM. But we can also move through this space, through this imaginary space shown by the videos uh, on the right. So we've got the heart in end diastole at uh, three different orientations and end systole on the far side. And as we're moving from health to HCM, you can see the walls thickening and the cavity becoming smaller. So you get a sense of what features uh, it is that characterise the difference between health and having HCM. And it's a fantastic concept really being able to move through this imaginary space from one disease type to another disease type to understand how the machine has made that differentiation. And we can move in the opposite direction from health to dilated cardiomyopathy and understand here we can see how the heart is getting bigger, its shape is changing, the difference between diastole and systole uh, is, is altered, indicating how the function is different. So completely automated, data-driven approach for interpretable diagnosis of heart disease. Now I mentioned uh, pulmonary hypertension earlier. We deal at the Hammersmith with a lot of pulmonary hypertension because we're one of the national referral centres for this. Uh, and this is disease, we're familiar with systemic hypertension, right? very common disorder. Um, so pulmonary hypertension is where the pressure rises in the pulmonary arteries. And the right side of the heart isn't very well designed at coping at elevated pressure. And initially it begins to hypertrophy, and then it begins to dilate and begins to fail. Um, often occurs in young people and can be rapidly fatal. But critically, the treatment for this is predicated on what their one-year risk of death is. If they have relatively low risk, they may get oral therapy. Higher risk than dual therapy. Higher still intravenous therapy. Higher still, they may be considered for heart and lung transplant. So if we can predict their risk of dying at 12 months, we can much more accurately tailor what the most appropriate treatment is for them. So that's the motivation for doing this. And here, for example, right ventricular ejection fraction, this is the number that we churn out on every cardiac MR report as being a wonder number for differentiating between patients who've got a good prognosis and a poor prognosis, but it's hopeless, right? So this patient on the left, RVF 22%, was alive for four years after the scan. A patient with the same ejection fraction on the other side, this patient died at six months. But I think you can appreciate those hearts look different, don't they, in lots of different ways. The motion of the septum, as you mentioned before, looks completely different. One heart's got some effusion around it. So there are lots of features that are different. So there's optimism that we could potentially train a machine to learn those features. And we know that the benchmark of ejection fraction is pretty poor. So this essentially is the task here, and I'll explain this uh, slightly crazy movie in a moment. So we take three, four hundred patients with pulmonary hypertension, and about a third of them uh, have died. So it's a historical set of data. We then feed those DICOM images into the machine. It automatically sorts them, 
It looks at the heart, identifies where the heart muscle is for the left ventricle and the right ventricle. It forms a 3D digital model of the heart and it tracks the motion of the heart at 2,000 points, 20 times a second. And we align all those data sets from each patient so we can compare them. And we get this model, this movie, uh, on the right. So here, this is the surface of the right ventricle, and these loops, these colored loops, show the path that uh, each point, each vertex on that model moves uh, during contraction and relaxation. So it's kind of contracting inwards and then relax relaxing outwards. So this, in a way, describes in a very precise, consistent way exactly how the heart is moving in these patients with primary hypertension uh, across 300 patients across a range of different severities. So now the second part of the puzzle is then training a machine to take that data and then learn how to predict how long those patients are going to survive. And again, this is another uh, data compression technique. So we've got the input data, these motion models. We're trying to create high fidelity reconstruction of those from a smaller number of features. So we're forcing this network to find elegant ways of understanding what the important differences are in this data set. So we can see that kind of bottleneck shape, bottlenecked shape of the, the neural net. But we're also rewarding it for learning which patients, uh, or learning efficiently how to predict patient outcome. So we're not imposing our thoughts on saying what's important, or even what, what to measure or where to look, it's learning those features. So you can see panel A, uh, these are the survival curves for conventional MR parameters that we do in every report, like the mass, the ejection fraction, the volume, and so on. And below it uh, is the machine learning motion analysis. Again, fully automated, no preconceptions, just learned how to do it. And you can see the survival curve, the differentiation is much better. Importantly, it's interpretable as well. So we kind of saw that uh, imaginary space where we can move from one disease to another. Well, we can do the same uh, with heart failure. For instance, here we've got the green dots of patients who had a good uh, outlook and the red dots of patients with a poor outlook. And then we can look at the function of the heart and how it's different in those groups. And also look at saliency maps. So which bits of the heart are most important for driving that classification? So a fully automated way, we give it the images, it analyzes those, it tracks their motion, and it gives you a really precise indication of how long that patient is going to live. So the cardiologists, the respiratory physicians in the clinic can um, prescribe the most uh, appropriate therapy for them. And it can do this in, in near real time. So the other thing I wanted to talk about was heart failure and genes. So um, dilated cardiomyopathy, commonest cause of, uh, of heart, tra heart transplantation. And we see uh, variants in a particular gene, the Titan gene, in about 20% of cases. Now here's the sort of molecular apparatus of the sarcomere, and in green is Titan. So it's like this big molecular spring. So when you have a genetic variant uh, in the protein that encodes for this, then the, the mechanical properties of the heart change. So it's elasticity changes. Uh, and this can lead to the development of, of DCM and heart failure. But about 1% of the population, so some lucky punter in this room, has one of these genetic variants. They're not super rare, but they don't seem to have heart failure when you, you might expect that they would. So what we did, we scanned 2,000 people. We did high resolution MR imaging in 3D to try and get the most accurate possible representation of the structure and function of the heart in 2,000 people like yourselves. Uh, and about 1% of those uh, have these genetic variants in the Titan gene. Now what we show here is actually we expected and thought up until now that their hearts were actually pretty normal, pretty healthy. But these red colours here show where the heart is different to those that don't carry that genetic variant. So their hearts are different, the shape, the function, subtly different, but a very strong signal. So what's thought is that these people's hearts are actually primed to fail in some way. And if we actually look at some more recent evidence, if you have one of these genetic variants in your Titan gene, and then you get exposed to alcohol, or you become pregnant, or you have uh, chemotherapy, then you are much more likely to develop cardiomyopathy and heart failure. So it's like a sort of two-hit hypothesis. You have that uh, predisposition, and your heart is in a kind of compensated state, but for most of the time, you don't have any symptoms or problems, but then you're exposed to some other environmental trigger, uh, and then the combination of those means you develop heart failure. So how will patients benefit uh, from AI and radiologists? So quantifying those cardiac MR, CT images can be pretty tiresome. 
pretty slow. Um, so actually, having automated analysis of those images really allows us to spend more time doing the things that, uh, that we are good at, uh, which is analysing more complex clinical cases. We can actually make much better diagnoses, perhaps diagnoses that we aren't quite familiar with, perhaps diagnoses that perhaps split up diseases that we're familiar with, or maybe coalesce different diseases that superficially look different to each other, but actually are much more meaningful in terms of uh, treatment. Risk prediction, as I said, we are poor as a community at predicting risk. We probably do it better in cancer, with cancer staging, uh, but particularly in heart disease, we're very poor at doing it. And machines, actually transformative technology for improving our performance. We can understand how genes um, influence heart disease uh, and modify our risk, and also, I haven't had time to touch on it, but also accelerate the discovery uh, of new treatments as well, in ways that really hadn't been possible until before. So I just want to touch on two, two things that have just um, uh, are, are in the news recently. Uh, and if any of you are having consultant interviews in the near future, this, this has come up at every consultant interview that I've been to uh, lately um, about the, the role of AI in the NHS. So Eric Topol, as you mentioned earlier, um, uh, published a review about preparing the NHS healthcare workforce to deliver the digital future. And it's worth just having a look at some of the messages from this because it is very interesting but it very much focuses uh, on building a digital ready workforce, and that's you. And I think radiologists who are informed and understand the role and limitations and applications of AI and machine learning uh, are much at, a, at, a, at a, much, uh, a huge advantage to those uh, who aren't. Uh, and actually patients, of course, should be suitably informed as well. That patient engagement uh, and support from patients uh, is incredibly important. And also from the cardiac point of view as well, the BHF have recently reported in this parliamentary uh, report about putting patients at the heart of artificial intelligence and actually getting that support and buy-in from patient groups, that confidence uh, that we're using their data responsibly and that we're making, uh, that, the, the, that our work is tightly regulated and evaluated is incredibly important for public confidence. And actually getting lots of people to talk together uh, about how to achieve this is, is essential for its success. So it's a fantastic area of research for people to get involved in and more and more radiology trainees are becoming excited about developing these techniques and about putting them into practice. But I would say my take home message is don't be too beguiled by the ideas of big data and AI. The most important thing is to start with an important clinical problem and listen to patients uh, to understand what those priorities should be. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you.